I, for one, am tremendously excited about this, what I think Jane rightly described as an experiment. Uh, we have tons of great talks here, and the events team in the museum, I think, does a wonderful job in bringing in all sorts of really interesting, diverse, um, smart people. Um, many of which uh, have reached that stage in life where they sort of, well, they have attractive silver locks and they've reached a certain stage of seniority and they sort of hold on, uh, they hold out on the, on the big picture. Um, these are the, the, the big scientists of our era, if you like. And yet the sad fact of the matter is, even though, yes, they are scientists and they're spokespeople for science, they're not the ones doing the science. Uh, they are sitting in their offices writing grants or probably actually jetting around the world giving keynote addresses, usually in Cape Town or San Diego. That's, that's what they're doing. Uh, the actual science, and this is perhaps science's best kept secret, is done by the graduate students. They're the people who are actually engaged with the scientific process. They're the ones actually developing new tools. They're the ones, if you like, hacking away at the rock face of knowledge, creating, if you like, new knowledge. I'm not sure that metaphor works. Um, and so I actually think this is um, a, a wonderful opportunity to hear from four uh, brilliant, don't let me down, guys, <laughs> uh, graduate students uh, from uh, sort of across the face of evolutionary biology. I hope you'll get a sense of the diversity of endeavor that is evolutionary biology collectively. I just want to sort of explain how we're going to do this. Each student has exactly eight minutes, and it is my mission to tackle them if they go over eight minutes. They are going in the order laid out there. So each will give an eight-minute talk, and then we'll have time for just a couple of questions pertaining to that talk. We'll go through all four, and then at the end, and obviously this is going to depend on how much time we have and so on, we're going to have a sort of panel style with all four students. So if you didn't get a chance to ask your question in the very brief, immediately after each lecture session, um, save up those questions and they can be asked later. So it is true. I'm obsessed with the pelvis. I would argue that it's the most evolutionarily important bone in the human body. And I'm going to talk a little bit today about how to build one. But first, a pop quiz. So I hope you came prepared. Uh, one of these is a chimpanzee and one of these is a human. So who thinks that A is the human? Oh, who thinks B is the human? Oh my god, great job, guys. Totally right, B is the human. And I just like to start with this and give this example because chimpanzees are our closest living relative, but when you look at our skeletons, the pelvis is just so dramatically different, and I'm really curious what's driving those differences. But what is the pelvis? Why is it important? Why should we care about it? The pelvis is the bone that anchors our legs to our body. And I'm using the term bone, and it's kind of a misnomer because the pelvis itself, each side, the right and left side, is actually three bones fused together. They form independently and fuse before we're even born. And so you have the ilium on top, which is kind of your sit bone, that you, or your hip bone, excuse me, that you can feel, your pubis that articulates in front with either side, and your ischium, which formed your sit bones in back. And it's important primarily for locomotion. Since it's anchoring our legs to our body, we couldn't do a lot of normal movements without a functioning pelvis. We couldn't walk, run, jump if our pelvis wasn't ideally adapted to those movements. And then also, particularly in mammals, it's a quintessential birthing structure. The pelvis itself really forms the birth canal. And in humans, that presents a bit of a unique challenge because we have big brains, and so our babies are born with pretty big heads. And so our pelvis needs to be able to accommodate the birth of large-brained offspring. And so these things about how we move and how we give birth are evolutionary pressures that have acted on the human pelvis throughout human evolution. And so when we compare the skeleton of a human and a gor gorilla, a great ape, another one of our very close relatives, to me the thing that jumps out first as the most dramatically different is the pelvis. It's shorter in humans, it's broader, it has kind of a bowl shaped to support our viscera. Since we're standing up straight or sitting up straight most of the time, um, we need to be able to support all of our internal organs, unlike a chimpanzee or a gorilla that's hanging down and its just guts are facing the ground, basically it doesn't need to support them. 
and then when you look at this lateral side view, you can really see that bowl shape that is formed in the human with that broad side that also allows for more muscle attachment for muscles that are important when we walk with our very unique gait of being a striding biped. And when I think about the question of how to build a pelvis, it's a question that I think about from two angles. You can think about how the pelvis forms during embryonic and fetal development before we're born, how our cells are reading the instruction manual of DNA and knowing how to put together a structure like a bone. And then you can think of the millions of years of evolution on the pelvis's size and shape and general structure. And really these two things are questions that inform each other because the evolution is acting on developmental processes that happen before we're even born. We're born with our fully formed human skeleton, and so evolution is acting before we're even born. But when, while we know this, we still know very little about the actual genes and portions of the genome that have been under selection and the genes that control pelvic development. And I say genes and regulatory portions of the genome because we're all pretty familiar with the idea of a gene as a hereditary unit, but one thing that's becoming more understood in science, and but perhaps still hasn't permeated to the general public as much, is that genes can be on or they can be off. And there are switches in our DNA that turn them on and off. And when we think about humans and chimpanzees, um, it's been known for decades now that human and chimp DNA is remarkably similar. A lot of us have probably heard statistics like 98, 99% identical between humans and chimps. And so it's been really a mystery of if our DNA is so, so similar, how do we account for the huge changes in how we look, how we behave, like what really makes us different from a chimp if our genes are very similar? And really the answer lies in the switches. The switches that are turning genes on and off have these fine-grained specific changes in humans that allow for these large, these small changes in DNA to be leveraged into large changes in appearance and behavior. And so with that in mind, thinking about these genes and switches, my work relies on genetic sequencing methods to identify these genes and switches that are active in the pelvis during development. And so I look at this in mice as a model organism, specifically mouse embryos, since I said your pelvis is being formed before you're even born. Um, and I, so I dissect out the pelvis and um, isolate pelvic cells. So this is like kind of pre-pelvic material down at the level of just a cell. And then I can do some experimental methods using enzymes whose job is to find open DNA. Because when we think of DNA in the nucleus of a cell, it's kind of a... Uh, dichotomous state, where it can be closed and tightly wound and therefore off, or it can be open and unraveled like a spool of thread and it can be on. And so this enzyme looks for those open and active regions of DNA, which are doing something. And once I have identified all these genes and gene switches, I can start to identify which have might have been targeted by evolution, because the results of these experiments yield tens of thousands, and that's more than I have time to sort through. So I want to look at just the ones that have been targeted by evolution to build our modern human bodies. And one way I do that is I compare them to what's called a human accelerated region. And a human accelerated region is a region of DNA that has more changes than we would expect. Because usually, um, in a sequence like a switch, if it has a job, it doesn't usually have changes between species. If you mutate that sequence, it could cause a disruption and it might not be good. And so usually across species, these functional sequences are identical. But every now and then you get a sequence where in humans, you have a few changes, where in great apes and other close relatives, there are no changes. And so that suggests that that sequence has been under natural selection and has undergone evolution. And so I can take advantage of this um, facet of the DNA and compare my pelvis switches that I identified in my research to the smaller set of human accelerated regions that have undergone evolution. And when I compare them, that narrows down my 32,000 pelvis active regions to just 122 that have been under evolution. And 122 is a much easier number to work with. I can deal with that in my seven year PhD. And that's the stage that I'm at now, is I'm looking for what these sequences actually do. Are these switches actually turning the gene on and off? And the way I investigate that is I can take the human sequence of the switch and the chimp sequence of the switch and engineer them in the lab to be attached in bacteria 
in cells to a gene called a reporter gene, which job is just to be on or off and is something that we can measure. And so if the, if the switch is turning the gene on, we'll know about it. And we know about it because the reporter has a signal that we can see. It's called GFP, green fluorescent protein, and if it's on, it lights up and we can measure that. And we can see, is the human switch driving a lot more of this uh, expression than the chimp switch? And if it is, and we get this strong signal like that, we could even take it a step further and look at um, if we cloned this sequence into a mouse, could we uh, see actual differences in its pelvic structure that are caused by the sequence of the switch? And so my conclusion is that this is a work in progress, and, but when we think about the large scale of human evolution, and we think about how humans and chimps shared a common ancestor about seven million years ago, we think about the uh, fossil Lucy, the fossil species Australopithecus afarensis, which lived about two to three million years ago. So Lucy was around I mean, roughly half the scale of the seven million years until now. And when we think about the Lucy skeleton, she had a pelvis that looked remarkably human-like already. And, but she had a pretty chimpanzee-sized brain. And so pelvis evolution and the formation of a modern human bipedal pelvis really predates the large human brains that we think of as characteristically human. And so I would argue that what makes us human is not necessarily our big, impressive brains, but our pelvis itself. Um, and if we can just unravel a bit about what, how the DNA builds our modern pelvis, that will tell us a little bit more about how we evolved to be who we are today. So thank you so much. I am going to talk today um, about butterflies, a bit about the wings, but really um, about hybridization. Uh, in Heliconius butterflies. That's what I'm really interested in. Uh, and you may have sort of been exposed to hybridization relatively recently. Some of you may have taken some Ancestry.com or 23andMe DNA tests and found out that you have uh, Neanderthal DNA in your genome. And that's because humans and Neanderthals hybridized um, in our distant past. Uh, and that might be surprising to some of you who may have learned in school that different species are not supposed to be able to hybridize and produce fertile and viable offspring. But in, in fact, not only um, have humans hybridized with Neanderthals, but it's relatively common uh, throughout the animal kingdom in, in nature. So there are lots of examples. There's uh, mammals like snowshoe hares. Uh, there's plants. This is a flock. Different species are known to hybridize with each other. Um, different fish. These are some trout that can hybridize. Uh, and also, of course, Heliconius butterflies. And these are what I study, and that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today. Uh, Heliconius is a really interesting and good system to study these questions for a bunch of reasons. Um, there are 47 different species of Heliconius. They all have a common ancestor around 12 million years ago, and that's very recent uh, in evolutionary time to get to 47 different species. Uh, here's a map um, of where a bunch of different Heliconius have been collected. Each different color is a different species. So you can see not only are they in these really cool places in the tropics and Central and South America, but they're sort of all overlap each other. So in any one place, there are a whole bunch of different species that are really closely related to each other, and that gives them a lot of opportunity to hybridize with each other. Another reason why Heliconius are really good to, to study is that they've been studied a lot before, and there's a lot known uh, about their ecology. And one of the most interesting things about their ecology, one of the best known things, um, is that they engage in mimicry. So this, if we went to one of these places uh, in South America and we sampled the butterfly community, we might find an assemblage of species like this. So there are Every, different, every butterfly here is a different species. Two of them are Heliconius. The two in the middle there are, are, are Heliconius. And they all mimic each other because some of these butterflies, including Heliconius, uh, are toxic. And that means um, if you're toxic and you look like other things that are toxic, you share the cost of educating predators about your toxicity. So a, a bird just has to eat one, one thing that looks like this to know that all the things that look like this are toxic and they shouldn't eat it. Okay, so that's pretty cool. Um, so, but like I said, I'm interested in hybridization, and it's pretty well known that Heliconius do hybridize with each other in nature. But what we wanted to do was to, to get a sort of general sense uh, for how common that hybridization is, and what is the effect on Heliconius genomes. Okay. And so we um, looked, I'm going to talk today about a subset of species, there are 47 in total. Today I'm going to talk about these six Heliconius species. And what we did was we went out. We collected some samples, uh, and we sequenced uh, their genomes. Okay? And the first thing we did was we just wanted to describe the evolutionary relationships between these species. 
Okay? And to do that, we compared um, their genome sequences, and we came out with an evolutionary tree uh, that looks like this. Okay? And this sort of describes um, this, the system of relationship among these butterflies. But the thing is, this was done um, with sort of the entire genomes of these butterflies. But it turns out the genomes are not homogenous. They're made up of lots of little bits, um, and each little bit might have a different evolutionary history. So if we think back to our 23andMe results, right, we might remember that sometimes uh, in, say, my DNA, there's some region um, where I acquired that DNA from a Neanderthal. And if we made an evolutionary relationship from just that region with me and some of you and some Neanderthals, I would group with the Neanderthals and not humans if we only use those Neanderthal regions. So we did a similar thing with these butterflies. And, and on a graph that looks like this, um, in those sorts of regions with different evolutionary histories, we might get um, a relationship, a topology uh, that looks more like that. Okay. So the butterfly genome is 300 to 400 million base pairs long. What we did was uh, we chopped that up into these 50,000 base pair bits, and we looked across to see uh, what the evolutionary histories are of the entire genome. Okay. So we could imagine that if the entire genome was just one history, and we look at all the 21 pairs of chromosomes that Heliconius have. We have 23, they have 21. We might expect we get a pattern like this. Everything just looks the same. If Heliconius are like humans and Neanderthals, where there's like 2 to 4% um, of, of genes that, that arose via hybridization, we might expect a pattern uh, more like this, where we see when this tree is in some percent of the genome. What we actually find is this. Okay, so there's a huge mix. Not only we get 35% of the blues, we get 35% of the reds, but we also have greens and light greens and oranges and pinks and all sorts of stuff. Okay? So there's lots and lots of hybridization going on in this group. Um, and it leads us to believe that maybe we shouldn't be thinking about evolution in terms of a diagram that looks like this, like a little tree, but instead as more of a network, okay, where we have connections between different species. Okay. So is that important for evolution? So to answer that, we looked a little more closely uh, at our map. And specifically, we wanted to look um, at a region down here on chromosome 15 that has this green topology. And the green topology looks like this. Uh, and so it, it sort of is like, like the red because these two species are more closely related to each other. But it's also different because then they group over here. Um, so it's a, it's a different evolutionary history. And we looked more closely at this region. Uh, so this is just that region blown up. Uh, and what we found is right in the middle of this green evolutionary history is this gene uh, called cortex. And it turns out the cortex is super important in, I think Andrew gave away um, the, uh, <laughs> the end here, but it's important in color pattern, right? So this is, there's some experiments done um, in the 80s by my advisor that showed that this region completely controlled the presence or absence of this yellow band in a species called Heliconius melpomene. And even more strikingly, in a species called Heliconius pneumata, the version of this cortex region that a butterfly has completely determines its color pattern. This is one species, and it mimics four different species okay, with one of these, each, of, each of these color patterns. Okay. So I, I hope I've convinced you now that, hel that, that hybridization has been important in the evolution and ecology of Heliconius butterflies, but it's also important in a whole bunch of other species. As we sequence more and more uh, genomes and more and more species, we find, in fact, uh, hybrids are everywhere. These are all species that have been shown to hybridize in the past, uh, and, and hybridization is something we need to take account of more um, very seriously when we think about uh, our evolutionary models. Uh, so thanks for your time, and I'm happy to take any questions. So adaptation to novel environments often involves changes in many traits, including both morphology and behavior. And one of the most striking patterns we observe when we look at the natural world is that even really distantly related organisms, when faced with similar environmental challenges, often evolve similar sets of traits. And this is a pattern we call convergent evolution. And when we see this pattern of convergence, we take it as a fairly strong hint that at least some of these things might be evolving in this way because they're somehow beneficial in these environments. But if we really want to understand how these adaptations work, we need to address a couple of really fundamental questions. First, we want to understand what are the genetic causes of these trait differences that are repeatedly evolving. And second, what are their functional consequences for the animal in its environment? And addressing this whole process from the level of DNA change to environmental significance is a pretty tall order. 
Um, so when we began this project, um, we thought that if we could identify a system where this type of repeated evolution has happened, but over a really short time scale, like within a single species, there are some really powerful tools we could use from traditional genetics to begin to under untangle some of these processes. And luckily for us, um, there's a great system for doing that right here in our backyard. Um, and that's these deer mice, Paramiscus maniculatus. So these are the native North American wild mouse. And um, they're all one species. But since the end of the last ice age, as the glaciers retreated across North America, um, a whole bunch of new environments sprung up across the continent. And these mice were really well positioned to colonize those new habitats and take advantage of those ecosystems. Um, and so even though they're one species, they're now found in a huge variety of habitat across the continent. And when naturalists began to pay attention to these mice, they noticed some really striking patterns. So wherever these mice occur in forested environments, they have some really consistent differences with their nearby neighbors who live in more open habitat. So the forest mice tend to nest in trees, they tend to climb more, and they have some specific morphological differences. And more recent genetic work suggests that this may have actually happened um, separately on the east and west coasts. So this could be a case of really recent convergence. Um, and we thought this might be a good system to address some of these questions about how evolution happens. But first we had kind of a more basic question, which is, is any evolution actually happening here at all? Because especially for some of those behavioral differences that I mentioned, your baseline expectation might be that it's actually just the experience of growing up in a forest that makes you a better climber. And so we want to know, are these differences actually inherited? And if so, are they the same or different in these two different populations? And to address those questions, we did an experiment that's called the common garden. And what it means is that instead of testing these mice in their native environments, we brought them all into the lab and raised them in a common environment with no opportunity to learn things like how to climb. And so we can just ask, are these characteristic differences still present among these populations within this single species when we raise them in a common environment? And we also need a way of measuring their behavior. And of course, we can't recreate an entire forest in the lab. But what we can do is give them the opportunity to voluntarily explore this arena and sometimes climb onto this narrow rod. And when they climb on the rod, we're there with our high-speed cameras to see what's going on. And so when we do that, um, here's what we see. This is a typical forest mouse raised in the lab on its first attempt. And we can use really recently developed tools in computer vision to quantify its behavior in a really thorough way. And you can see it did pretty well. And by contrast, here's, another, here's a typical prairie mouse. Um, same species, raised in the same environment. And you can see it's really not doing nearly as well. And so, <laughs> so, and we're quantifying its behavior as well. And so you can see that um, if we, re and so if we repeat this experiment with these four populations, we actually find some really consistent differences between the forest and the prairie mice. So as you just appreciated, um, the forest mice are better at this balancing task. Um, and they also tend to climb more, so they have a higher preference to engage in this behavior. And then there are those morphological differences. So the forest mice have longer tails, which are composed of both more and longer tail vertebrae. And they also have bigger feet. They differ in some other behaviors that we can measure in the lab. And importantly, we're sure that they differ in a bunch of other traits that we haven't even measured. Right. So we'd like to understand why these traits are repeatedly evolving in this forest population and why they're showing up together. And there are two major possibilities. So one is that we always see these traits appearing together because they share some common genetic or developmental mechanism. So for example, if there's a single base pair change that affects both your foot length and your tail length, then even if only one of these traits is functionally relevant, we're always going to see them both show up because you, can only, um, you can't get one without the other. right? And by contrast, these could each be genetically independent traits in which case they seem to be repeatedly evolving in these habitats, and we're curious about why. But how can we detangle these things, given that, as I just told you, the forest mice always have all the forest traits, and the prairie mice always have the prairie traits? 
And that's where we can take advantage of the fact that this has all happened within a single species, and we can pull a really tried and true technique from traditional genetics that's been in use in science since Mendel and in agriculture long before that. And that's the genetic cross. So if we mate a forest to a prairie mouse, we can generate a first generation hybrid. So this mouse has one copy of each gene from the forest parent and one from the prairie parent. And if we interbreed these mice together, we can generate second generation hybrids, each of which has a random complement of forest and prairie DNA. And so we expect to um, produce some hybrids who fundamentally look similar to the parents. But if these traits are genetically unlinked, we'd actually expect to generate trait combinations that we didn't see before. So for example, a mouse with a short prairie-like tail, but forest-like behavior. And if all these traits are unlinked, we actually expect to uncover all the possible combinations. And so first, by just looking at which trait combinations appear in these hybrid mice, we can get a sense of which of these traits are genetically linked. And then we can also run them through our functional test of their ability to balance. And we can ask which of these characteristics actually affect their performance. And when we do that, we find a couple of really interesting things. So first, I already told you that tail length is the output of both vertebra length and vertebra number. And even though the forest mice always have more and longer vertebrae, in the cross, those two things are completely independent. So there are different genetic changes that have evolved to affect vertebra length and vertebra number in these mice. And of course, it's a little more complicated than that because we think some of the genetic changes that affect vertebra length also affect foot length in these guys. And when we look at their performance, we find that actually tail length and foot length independently both increase the climbing performance of the hybrid mice. But when we look at climbing preference, we see something really different and something I think is really interesting. So you'll recall that the forest mice climb a lot and they also do really well at it. But in the cross, in these hybrid mice, we uncover some individuals who hardly ever climb onto that rod, but when they do, they do a great job. And we also have other individuals who really seem to do it a lot, but they just can't get the hang of it, right? <laughs> so climbing preference and climbing performance are completely unlinked, which suggests that there's at least one other genetic change that may have evolved to affect climbing preference in these mice. And of course, we're really interested in what those actual DNA changes are. And um, we can use markers scattered throughout the genome that tell us whether something was inherited from the forest or the prairie parent. And we can make a map that assesses um, how likely it is, or how, strongly the, how strong the association is between having something inherited from the forest parent and having, for example, a longer tail. And so here I'm showing you just such a map um, that was made by a fellow graduate student in the lab, Evan Kingsley. And it just shows the six chromosomes where he found some kind of association with having a longer tail. And what I want to highlight is that half of these things are associated with having more vertebrae and half with having longer vertebrae. And so um, we're doing this kind of experiment for all the traits I've told you about, both behavior and morphology. Um, but because we're doing these experiments in parallel in the eastern and western mice, we can actually step back and address a, a bigger evolutionary question. And that's when we see these repeated um, convergence on morphology and behavior, to what extent are those things the result of similar or different changes at the molecular level? So is there a single path to generating a forest mouse that has been taken over and over again? Or are there many ways to get to the forest phenotype? And so all of that is in the near future, but for now I hope I've shown you how by drawing on this extensive natural history work and combining traditional genetic approaches with really new techniques for quantifying behaviors, um, we can begin to understand something fundamental about how organisms adapt to their environment. Um, and before I take hopefully some questions, I just wanna highlight that I get to be here to tell you about this work, um, but it's really the product of a great collaboration with a bunch of really talented graduate students, researchers, and even some undergraduates, so thank you. My name is Aideen Harney, and I'm a fourth year graduate student with David Reich and John Wakeley. Um, and I'd like to talk to you today about how we can use biomolecular tools like ancient DNA to study the human past. And in order to do this, I'd like to focus on a site with a particularly mysterious past called Rupkund Lake. So Rupkund Lake is a high altitude site located in the Indian Himalayas. 
It's located at about 16,000 feet above sea level. So just for reference, this is taller than the highest peaks in the contiguous United States. Now, Rukun Lake is frozen for about 11 months out of the year. But when the snow and ice melts, it reveals the skeletons of several hundred humans scattered in and around the lake's shores. Over the years, there's been a great deal of speculation about who these individuals might have been. Local folklore describes a group of pilgrims who were traveling to the nearby shrine of the mountain goddess Nanda Devi. However, their disrespectful behavior on their journey angered the goddess, and so she rained death upon them, flinging hailstones hard as iron. Other hypotheses include kind of a similar story, where you have a large group of individuals, possibly merchants or an army or pilgrims, all traveling together only to be struck down by a catastrophic event like a blizzard, hailstorm, or rock slide. However, no one knows for sure who these individuals were, what brought them to Rukund Lake, or even how, when they died. So these are some of the questions that I'd like to answer. Now, you might be wondering why this study has been included in a lecture series about evolution, since it deals with the relatively recent past. You might instead have been expecting to see something like this, a phylogeny showing the relationships between humans and other primates. But I'd like to argue that we can actually apply the same evolutionary tools that we would use to study these relationships to study the more recent past. So zooming in on the most recent part of human history, I'm going to apply genetic analyses to study um, evolutionary relatedness. Now, it's important to remember that we don't analyze genetic information in isolation. Humans live spread throughout the globe, and we can actually use this information to inform our analyses. So although the picture I've drawn here is admittedly a little bit of an oversimplification, and there's other factors that we need to consider, like admixture, which is the mating between two previously separated populations, and migration. So one of the ways that we can factor in these challenges is by using ancient DNA, which allows us to form a glimpse into the past, which will give us information about what genetics looked like at different periods in time. So using ancient DNA, we can sample from ancient bones and generate DNA information. We can then analyze this DNA information to form population genetic models, which, within collaboration with archaeologists and historians, we can use to tell stories about what might have happened in the past. So turning back to Rukund, I hope that by using ancient DNA to analyze the genetics of these individuals, we might be able to come closer to figuring out who they might have been. So working in collaboration with archaeologists and historians from India who were actually able to travel to Rupkund Lake and bring back samples, we were able to obtain ancient DNA from 38 individuals from Rupkund Lake. In order to do this, we sampled bones and extracted their DNA. And then we sequenced this DNA to gather genome-wide information. Now, this might sound like a relatively simple process, but I'd like to remind you that ancient DNA is easily degraded and, contamin and contaminated. So the likelihood of failure is actually quite high. In order to reduce the probability of failure, we actually do all of our wet lab analyses um, in specialized ancient DNA clean rooms. So you can see me here dressed up for one of our ancient DNA clean rooms. So once we'd obtained DNA information from these individuals, I used a tool called principal components analysis, which is essentially a way of mapping onto two-dimensional space individuals based on their genetic similarities. So in this plot shown here, you can see individuals from West Eurasia, East Asia, the Andaman Islands, and India. And now you'll notice that in this plot, Indian individuals form this kind of long gradient of ancestry that we refer to as a genetic cline. So individuals with ancestry that's more closely related to West Eurasian populations will fall towards the lower end of this genetic cline, while individuals with ancestry that's more closely related to the Andaman Islanders will fall towards the top. So my question is, where do the Rupkund individuals fall on this plot? To whom are they most closely related? So when I project a subset of the individuals from Rupkund, who I'm going to call Rupkund A, onto this plot, we see that they cluster with Indian populations. However, I should note that their distribution along this cline is actually really surprising because it's not what we'd expect to see in present-day Indian populations. Present-day populations from India tend to cluster really tightly together along this cline. So for instance, a population called the Brahmin Tawari will fall towards the bottom of the cline, whereas another population called the Mala will cluster much higher up. 
So the distribution of the Rupkund A individuals spread out along this genetic cline suggests that they're actually not from a single homogeneous population, but instead these individuals have ancestry from throughout the Indian subcontinent. Now what brought all these individuals with their diverse ancestry together at Rupkund Lake is a mystery, but we potentially have some hints of what might have brought them there. Rupkund Lake is actually located quite near a local pilgrimage route, so it's possible that all of these individuals came together to go on this pilgrimage, as local legends suggested. Now, I mentioned that this is only a subset of our data, and so during PCA analysis, we actually identified three distinct genetic clusters, and the position of the other genetic clusters on this plot is even more surprising. So the second genetic cluster that I'm going to call Rupkund B actually clusters with populations from West Eurasia, suggesting that these individuals don't have Indian ancestry at all, but instead are more closely related to populations from Europe and the Near East. So I'm going to use another tool called Pairwise FST to analyze this data further. Pairwise FST is a measure of the genetic similarity between two populations. So for this analysis, we compared the Rupkund B individuals to every other population in our data set. And populations that they're more closely related to are shown in darker colors. So what you see here actually confirms our previous analysis that the Rupkund B populations are actually most closely related to groups from the Western, um, Western Eurasia. And zooming in further, we can actually see that they're most closely related to populations from the Eastern Mediterranean region, and most specifically present-day Crete. So while the existence of a pilgrimage route uh, near the Rupkund Lake site maybe explains the reason why the Rupkund A individuals might have gone to Rupkund, it's harder to imagine that, the, that people from the Eastern Mediterranean would have traveled all the way to India and then trekked to Rupkund to go on a similar pilgrimage. So the reason for their presence in Rupkund Lake is still a mystery. And the mystery doesn't stop here. Going back to our PCA plot, I'd like to highlight a third cluster, which I'm going to call Rupkund C. Now the Rupkund C individual, um, there's just one individual in this cluster, appears to have Southeast Asian ancestry. Since there's only one individual, it's hard for me to say more about the genetics of this, of this cluster. So we actually observe three completely genetically distinct groups among the people found at Rupkund Lake. Now one question I've yet to answer is when did these people come to Rupkund Lake and did they all travel together? So using radiocarbon dating, we were able to obtain dates for all of these individuals. And what we found adds a further twist to our story. We find that the Rupkund A individuals date to around the 9th century. Although the variation that we see in these dates actually suggests that maybe these individuals didn't travel together and die during a single event. Now in contrast, looking at the Rupkund B and Rupkund C populations, we actually see that they died about a thousand years later in the early 19th century. So by combining uh, biomolecular analyses like ancient DNA and carbon dating, we found that the skeletons of Rupkund Lake are not the product of a single catastrophic event as previously thought. But instead, this is the result of multiple distinct diverse groups of people making separate journeys to Rupkund Lake only to die. So around the 9th century, people with ancestry from all throughout the South, uh, the South um, Asian continent went to Rupkund Lake. And then about a thousand years later, people with ancestry from the Eastern Mediterranean and Southeast Asia also went to Rupkund Lake only to die. So perhaps local legend is partially correct and that some of these individuals might have gone to Rupkund Lake um, on a pilgrimage only to be struck down during a blizzard or a hailstorm. Or maybe they went to Rupkund for an entirely different reason. This is as far as genetic analyses can take us, and in some ways it's only made this mystery more mysterious. So we turn now to archaeologists and historians to help us fill in the gaps. So as I leave you today, I hope that I've, this example has impressed upon you the power that ancient DNA and other biomolecular tools have for giving unexpected insights into our past. The events at Rupkund Lake only happened in the last thousand years or so, so just imagine what we could learn about our deeper past. So before I go, I'd just like to acknowledge all the people who made um, this study possible, including our collaborators and those individuals, both living and dead, um, whose DNA we analyzed. And I'd be happy to take your questions.